thanks everyone for uh, listening into this uh, talk. So I'm very happy to talk about uh, the pristine survey on CFHD. And so this talk is about pr uh, probing the early Milky Way uh, with this uh, pristine survey. Uh, so my name is Elsa Starkenberg from the University of Groningen uh, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, so one excellent way to start studying the early Milky Way is by using uh, metal poor stars. And that is because, as we all know, the universe started out just made out of hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium. And so over the generations of stars that were created, this uh, metal content has been building up. So if we want to look back in time, then one way to do that is to look at long-lived stars that have very uh, little of these uh, heavy elements in uh, their atmospheres. And so we can use these stars to study the buildup of uh, the Milky Way galaxy, but we can even try to probe a little bit further and to find and research the very first generations of stars uh, that we have in our uh, local part of uh, the universe, so that were made inside uh, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so the current state of art of this field is actually that there's uh, very few stars known that belong to these very earliest uh, generations. Uh, but at the same time, they're very important. Uh, they give us a very unique window into the early universe. And I've kind of tried to sketch that out below. So you see uh, this kind of scale of F over H. So to the left is where we typically think uh, the earlier generations of stars are. And uh, at zero is our sun, of course. And if we then look into Milky Way stellar populations, then about 99% of all the stars uh, uh, that we know uh, lies in the disk and the bulge of uh, the galaxy. And these have a metallicity distribution that peak around the sun. And about 1% uh, of uh, the stellar mass is in the Milky Way halo that has a lower uh, metallicity peak and a very long tail uh, to the lowest metallicities. But we only know of about 40 stars that are below a metallicity of minus four. So less than one over 10,000 of the metal content of our sun. Um, so these stars are important because they tell us um, many different things. So for instance, their nucleosynthesis uh, pattern that tells us something about the early chemical processes in uh, the galaxy. Uh, but also uh, we can learn a lot from the way that they are distributed today and the way that they move inside the galaxies. So that tells us something about how the earliest stellar populations uh, in the galaxy uh, uh, got to be where they are today. Uh, so this is a wonderful picture from Gaia of about 1.8 uh, billion stars that Gaia has measured. And so in, uh, we try to do, make an estimate. And in a typical uh, halo field, there's only one in every 40,000 stars that had, has this metallicity below minus four. So that also explains why we know so few of them. Uh, even if you have large spectroscopic surveys that measure hundreds of thousands of stars or even millions of stars, you will just find uh, a few of these stars. So this is really a kind of needle in a haystack problem. And uh, the question is, of course, how we can we find uh, these very pristine uh, stars? And so that was basically the motivation to start uh, the pristine survey on CFHG. And what we have done started in uh, 2014 when we applied for a special color filter uh, that would turn CFHG into an efficient machine for finding a very early generation stars. And the way that this, uh, this filter works is that we basically block out uh, all of the light except between 390 and 400 uh, nanometers. So it is here that a typical uh, stellar spectrum is showing some of the strongest uh, absorption lines uh, that we know of, the calcium H and K lines. And so for a star like the sun, this looks a little bit like uh, this red spectrum that you see here. But if the star has less metals in its atmosphere and so less calcium, then it looks a little bit different. Uh, so you see here what it looks like for a star that has a tenth of uh, the solar metallicity. And you see that the absorption lines become narrower and thus there's less absorption of the light. And so it looks a little bit brighter in uh, this color filter. If we then go to minus two, then you see that the lines become even narrower and that there is, um, there's even uh, less uh, uh, signal in this, uh, sorry, there's even, the star looks even brighter 
in uh, in this uh, this filter. If you go to minus three, then uh, that's of course more and more the case. And because these are uh, synthetic, so modeled spectra, I could even try a star that has no heavy elements at all. And so this is the kind of trick that we use to then observe large parts of the sky and to uh, look for uh, these very early uh, generations of stars. But it's not just that that we get. So we get a, a very efficient way to weed out these, these very interesting stars, but we also get photometric metallicities for millions of stars uh, in the FGK uh, range. And so that is the idea of the pristine survey in short. So the idea is that instead of looking for the needles in the haystack, we make the needles stick out of the haystack um, so that we can uh, find and uh, research them uh, with some ease. Uh, so we've been going since uh, to 2015 uh, that we had our first observations as a PI program. And so we have uh, right now, I did a quick count, we have over 8,000 uh, unique uh, megagram pointings. Uh, we have um, so over 40 international team members and about 22 peer-reviewed publications, and there's more in uh, various stages of, uh, of review. So this is the full team. Uh, I hope I got everyone. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful to be working uh, with these wonderful people on all of the science that we do. So I cannot possibly discuss, of course, 22 uh, papers in the short amount of time. So I'll have to make a selection and I'll try to give you the kind of broad topics that uh, we've been working on as a collaboration. So this is the, the footprint from Pristine on the sky. So you see that it is still a bit patchy, but that we're starting to fill in quite a lot of the halo of uh, the galaxy. So we're looking away from the disk where we have a lot of dust, uh, but we're also trying to target the inner parts of the galaxy in a special uh, program as well. And we have some special pointings where we have some, uh, some sources that we are especially interested in like dwarf galaxies or some globular clusters that we took initially for calibration. So let me just start by going through the different uh, Milky Way components that we've looked at so far. Uh, so to start the Milky Way halo in pristine. Um, so it is very interesting to study the metallicity distribution function of the halo. Uh, we know it's surprisingly poorly, I would say, uh, just because all of the spectroscopic surveys that are usually very good for this, they all have their own uh, selection effects. Whereas within pristine, because it's imaging and you get basically uh, all of the FGK stars in your image, um, you're essentially a lot more unbiased. Uh, and so it's interesting to compare these results uh, than with spectroscopic uh, results. So we did have a first pass of, at, at this in uh, 2020 uh, with a paper from uh, Chris Hewakim, where we broadly looked at the halo and the F from five to 15 kiloparsecs from us. And we're now trying to improve on that using Gaia data to select uh, stars with halo kilomatics and also very good uh, distances and then explore the metallicity patterns in different distances and different sidelines. So this is a kind of uh, preliminary result from that where we see uh, we're basically stepping away from the disk plane. So we're stepping further and further into the halo. And we see that uh, the metallicity kind of changes as we go further out. So it goes a bit more metal poor, but also we're kind of losing this, this uh, first um, metal rich peak uh, slowly. Besides uh, characterizing the, the broad properties of the galaxies, we're also very interesting in following up specific substructures, but I won't talk much about this now because we have basically a talk coming up next, talking about a very exciting result that we recently had and also a poster uh, by Rafael Rani. Uh, we're also studying bound galaxies, so uh, satellites that are still bound to the uh, to, to themselves. And this is, uh, will be talked about by Nicolas Ronjara. So um, we are not really a disk survey, but we cannot avoid looking through the disk when we look into the halo. And actually this turned out to be a very fortunate thing because we, we made some surprising discoveries about uh, the metal poor disks of uh, the Milky Way. And the first one of this is that a relatively large fraction of uh, the ultra metal core stars, so those below minus four, 
but also those below minus three or even those below minus two, they stay very close to the disk plane in their orbits. So once we had full orbits for them with Gaia, we discovered that a lot of them don't venture very far out uh, from the disk plane. And we looked into simulations and we saw that this is actually tracing some, very, some of the very ancient formation of uh, the Milky Way system. So these stars are particularly interesting. And so this is work led by uh, Federico Sestito. We also saw that this, uh, com the, uh, when we looked into the thin disk, we also saw a component that was uh, surprisingly metal poor that also uh, we did not see this clearly before. And this is illustrated in this figure and is written up in a, in a very careful paper by uh, Emma Fernandez Alva last year. So besides uh, looking into the disk, we also have the specific uh, parts of the survey that I also uh, uh, discussed already briefly, that is talking, uh, that is looking into the uh, galactic center as much as we can, because we cannot go straight to the galactic center that is just too obscured, but we try to go as close as we can. And this is work that is led by Anka Arendsen, who also has a poster, and it's called the Pristine Inner Galaxy Survey. So um, it's very, it's even more difficult in the galactic center and that region uh, to find metaporous stars because the, the general metallicity is so much higher. Um, but it's also very reward, rewarding to do that because it, uh, it's a population that's very understudied and potentially it has many very, very old stars. So Anke has assembled a sample of about 1,300 very metal poor stars in this region, more than doubling uh, the literature and really focusing on the metallicity regime that is not very well studied if you have a metallicity blind survey. So you see this in the, in the bottom panel. If you look into Apogee or Argos, then they have very different metallicity peaks. But if you then look into this sample from pigs, you see that we're really covering uh, this part that is almost not covered because it is in the very low tail of, uh, of these surveys. And what she finds, uh, what we find is that there is some very interesting kinematics. So these stars move very differently from the metal rich population. And there's also some interesting chemistry going on in this part. And so Federica will uh, talk a bit more about that. So, so far I have talked about uh, how to study the buildup of the Milky Way galaxy from pristine. And now in the final few minutes, I'd like to uh, take you along and see how far we can push into these very first uh, generations of stars. So this is a, um, a compilation of stars in the literature. Um, so here again is the FE of Rage for all the stars that have an FE of rage of less than minus three, so that are really already extremely metal poor. And so you see that they become, of course, sparser when we go down, um, but you also see that on this other axis, I plot carbon over iron, and you also see that a lot of them become a lot more carbon rich. And so we think that that is actually something that is telling us about this very early enrichment, very early in the universe that is different uh, than uh, stars uh, that go supernova today. And so with the pristine survey, we added some, uh, some really interesting stars to this. Uh, so I posted the list of, uh, of all the different papers that they were doing individual follow-up and finding stars on, on interesting orbits or with interesting abundances. And we also added two of the most uh, metal poor stars known. And so note that these are low in iron, but that especially this one is also low in carbon. And that you start to have this little group uh, down here, uh, which is a bit different from this group that is up here. And so what we really want to know is, are these really two distinct groups, two formation paths maybe in the early universe of forming uh, these very metal poor stars? Or is it really a continuum? And are we only because of, of sparse sampling uh, seeing it as uh, two groups? So fortunately, we have a very good way forward to discuss all these kind of questions and much more uh, because of uh, the work that we're doing with uh, the WEAVE uh, survey. Um, so WEAVE will be observing a thousand stars simultaneously and it will start uh, later this year. So we're very excited about this. And Pristine and Weave have an agreement that uh, we will give Weave all of our best targets and we will then get in return the spectroscopy for all of these best uh, candidates. 
which means that together we will homogeneously study about 30, over 30,000 extremely metal poor uh, stellar candidates. So this is adding 30,000 stars in this very, very interesting uh, regime and increasing samples of over tenfold. And so this will definitely be a very, very big leap forward and uh, almost guaranteed to have a lot of new insights because from the Reef spectra, we cannot just confirm that these are so metal poor, but we can also measure all of these elements uh, in uh, the spectrum. And so things that we are uh, that we want to understand a bit better are what were the properties of the first stars and their supernovae. And now we can really start to look into this, oh, sorry, from populations rather than from individual stars. So that will really be uh, a game changer. One minute. I'm, I'm closing, thank you. And uh, we'd also very much like to understand if this evolution is universal across different galactic environments. And for this, it's important to not just have uh, the weave survey, but also foremost, that is uh, following up a lot of the stars that we have in the, in the galaxy. So in conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you that uh, the pristine survey on CFHT is really good to find uh, the needle in the haystack. And um, using uh, all of the kind of bad weather time that we have on Megacam uh, for uh, this purpose. And we're uh, allowing, uh, allowing us to study the buildup of the Milky Way from the inner galaxy through the disk to the outer halo, as well as the properties of uh, first stars and uh, uh, star formation at the very early universe. And so I'm very happy uh, and excited about the steps ahead, uh, especially in combination with uh, Weave and Foremost that will give us lots of spectroscopy. And also the, the, the next uh, Gaia data release is giving us even better motions and uh, distances. So with that, uh, I would be very happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Questions? You showed us that you get to explore very different regimes in metallicity uh, from a spectra, from Apogee, say, and Pristine uh, on the other side. Um, so both have different uh, selection functions. How, how do you study uh, the selection function of Pristine in metallicity? Yeah, so we uh, specifically uh, target the, the stars that look metal poor in this program in the, in the galaxy. So this is actually from spectroscopy, the, the metallicity distribution function that you saw. And so what we, uh, we take the ones from the photometry that we think are most metal poor and follow those up. So there's, there's clearly a, a very strong selection effect, but in this case, that is uh, our selection bias. But in this case, that is exactly the purpose. Um, so we do want to uh, want to study these stars that just in in sheer number are uh, outnumbered by the more metal rich stars, but that show us a very different um, uh, picture of uh, the inner galaxy and uh, a much more a picture of of how it was um, when it was when it was still uh, getting into place. So of the oldest populations possible. Okay, thank you. Any other question from the web? Nothing. Okay, thanks again, Els, and go to the next speaker, Nicola. Thank you.